Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Cultural History of Canada. My name is Patrick, and with me, as always, is my co-host with the mostest, Mac. Are we officially the Cultural History of Canada and not Historic Canadiana sure. anymore? What, whatever, it doesn't matter. Our branding is not very on point, good sir. <laughs> Our we're, a cultural kind history of... Of, we're a Cultural History of Canada by name, but I didn't change the art, which still says Historia Canadiana, because I don't have time to change the artwork. Well, I also like our logo. Our artwork's pretty fire. I know. Um, but for like search purposes, it's much easier if people look up history and Canada, right? So that'll show up. Anyway. Okay. So like informally, so, Historia yes. Canadiana, formally cultural history of Canada. Exactly. If you're a it real one, you, if you're a real one, you remember when this channel was Historia Canadiana. Should we rebrand to a Bert and Ernie podcast? <laughs> we don't know about that one, Patrick. You don't even know what Burton and Ernie sound like. I couldn't even keep up this joke. <laughs> oh, God. I'll send you a meme later. There's a whole like short story somebody wrote about Burton and Ernie being radio hosts. And then the end of the world starts. Like the end of the world, like nuclear apocalypse is happening, but they keep on their radio show to like go to the end of the world to give people comfort. So, <laughs> so it's the word of the world's myth? <laughs> I guess. But anyway, so like Bert puts on a really nice suit. He looks at Ernie, and this is the ending of the story. Like they can see the mushroom pop in Bert's hair, and he goes, How do I look, Ernie? And Ernie responds, With your eyes, Bert. That's how the story ends. We're <laughs> oh, truly off to a stellar start on this. This, <laughs> this is a show stay. that we record. Like, we record on Friday night after we both have a full week of teaching in our body. So this oh, is Friday great. night for you, Saturday morning for me. I'm hungover yeah, right even, now. Even better. <laughs> Before we actually get into the content of today's episode, a um, few things. First of all, thank you for all our patrons who put up with our shenanigans and actually give us money. That's incredible. And I'll never get over that people are willing to do that, no matter how many there are. And if you want to support the show, you can do so for a dollar or three dollars a month, whatever you feel, um, even more if you want. But yeah, uh, and you can get extra content like the recent episode of Pop Canada that we recorded. The last one was on Brendan Fraser, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes, um, the phrase yes. man. The phrase man. Um, it was fun as all of them are. So you get extra episodes, you get early episodes, all of that good stuff. The second thing I want to bring up, because it's Canadian related, and because we talked about Ronald Reagan last episode, when we were talking about Mary Pickford, Canada's version of Ronald Reagan died. And that's good. Um, do you know who, who I'm talking about, Matt? Called? Nope. <laughs> Brian Moroni. Um, oh, we had Mulronomics? Uh, Mul yes. Oh, yes. We, it was Reaganomics with a Canadian flavor to it. It tasted like maple mm. syrup when they were... I was about to make a over. maple syrup joke. <laughs> <laughs> we're not high comedy. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Brian Mulroney will be fondly remembered for the North American Free Trade Agreement, right? Which exists solely to allow multinational corporations to profit and exploit with as little government oversight as possible in North America. So good for you, Brian Mulroney, for helping Canada enter that agreement. Uh, mm -hmm. He will also be remembered for cutting the corporate tax rates in Canada from 36% to 28% in one fell swoop, thus kicking mm -hmm. off a, you know, history, a modern history of cutting corporate tax rates ever since. Um, and he even is better known for selling off a third of Canada's state-owned crown corporations. All of this <laughs> was done in the name of cutting down our budget costs, and that didn't work. But hey, at least we now own less public stuff. It's Fun. Cool. Yep. Have we sold our streets yet? Around. No, but I'm okay, sure we're it'll not come Chicago eventually. then. 
I saw that video. It is madness. Like, what are you even doing, Chicago? Oh, Chicago, (laughs) Chicago. Living in Chicago. Yeah. Oh, it was also Brian Moroni that approved sending the military into the Oka crisis so that people could build a golf course. Mm. Yeah, on indigenous land. So, again, 10 out of 10. Brian. But where would the people hit their golf balls? It's not like we already have a bunch of golf courses. I'm sure I'm gonna get an email from some angry boomer. He's like, who's like, uh, Brian Mulroney was the like last greatest prime minister in Canada. I don't fucking care. I don't. I mean, care. if you're gonna get an email from my mother, it's gonna be about the Oka crisis. Great, that's fine. I'd accept that. There's a lot to discuss about the Oka crisis. It's whatever. <laughs> Oka crisis on infinite earths. Hello. No, 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 no. Oka's so, in crisis. Crisis Oka on identity infinite. Crisis. crisis on infinite infinite Oka's. Yeah. <laughs> Death metal Oka crisis. <laughs> this is a reference that like three of our listeners are gonna get. That's fine. That's okay. so. What are we talking about today, Patrick? Even though Brian Mulroney is dead, long live Brian Mulroney. Are we talking about today, Mac? You tell me. We're talking about art. We're closing those boring, dusty old books, and we're looking at some dope-ass paintings now. Hell yeah. While still talking a little bit about literature, if we have time. Yeah. But... We'll make the time. So We'll make the time, yeah. But we're talking specifically, as you can tell from the title, about probably the most famous painters ever to come out of Canada, Right. Um, which are known colloquially as the Group of Seven, although they have had different names throughout time, throughout their history, and even during their time. And I feel like I'm going to have a heart attack, depending on how you answer this question. Have you ever heard of the Group of Seven? No. How in the fuck have you lived in Canada for most of your life without having heard of, at least mentioned, the Group of Seven? How? You you have to understand, me and like paintings do yeah. not mix. Even more like there's more of a distance between me and paintings there is than there is between me and poetry. That is like, incredible. Me and, me and poetry are like friends by association because we both hang out with like novels, and so we have to sort of be polite to each other. Meanwhile, me and paintings like we don't even look at each other. I cover my eyes and I look the other way when I see paintings. Okay, I guess that's as good a place to start as any. Why do you hate painting? like, Or why do you just not engage with painting as an art form? Honestly, it's a time thing. Like, I look at a painting, I'm like, cool, saw the painting, next one. <laughs> what are you even saying? You don't, like, <laughs> let it wash over you and, like, enter into... What, what kind of cultural critic are... Oh my god. <laughs> I think that might have been the worst thing you've ever said on this show. <laughs> that is my worst take, obviously. <laughs> there are, there have been some, like, the really big and famous ones. So, mm-hmm. like, when I saw Starry Night, Van Gogh's yeah. Starry Night, that, like, yeah. But for the most part, I'm like, I don't know who the painter is. I don't know their story, so I don't give a shit. To me, art yeah. gets meaning from its story, like, where it comes from, who is the story, like, etc., Mm-hmm. Which is why, like, I would have art that was written, that was created for me by Little Kids in Summer Camp. That means more to me than some famous fucking painting that I don't know. Yeah, no, that's fair. I, I do think that context does play a vital part uh, in paintings, which is why I think it's cool to see them in museums as part of a gallery or something like that, because you get that explanation or at least some background. Um, but yeah, like, I think more than you, I I will take the time, even if I look at it through a screen or anything like that, I will appreciate the beauty of a painting. But yeah, there is something yeah. about like materially seeing it. Um, yeah, I'm just like in front of you. You just show like, me a really random changes. painting. I can be like, oh, yeah, that looks like a great painting and there's cool details, but I can only stare at it for so long. <laughs> yes, no, for sure. And I think that's that's particularly true of the paintings we're talking about today. Right? Mm. And we're not going to necessarily talk about the paintings, any particular painting for listeners, because they have so many, right? Just mm. hundreds. Um, so we're not going to talk about a particular painting that was produced but by any of the, the members of the group of seven. But links in the doobly-doos to look at the paintings. 
Yeah. And you could just Google it if you really want to. Like there's, there, there are That's what plenty I of them. Yeah, exactly. So not, uh, not a specific painting, but you know, you can get a sense of what they're going for just mm. through the internet pictures. But yeah, I, I, I get more out of it knowing when they made it and why they're important historically. Right. Um, yeah. Much more than. Yeah. And I feel like if I'd seen an actual gallery of them, which I would be interested in seeing, mm. like actually seeing the texture of the paint might get. Yeah. More well, like it's also it. it's it's I find it similar, like all art forms. The best equation I can think of it is to food as an art form. Like oh, okay. if you don't know the techniques of what goes that like, goes into the food, you can't like you can appreciate. Oh, yeah, this tastes good but your taste buds aren't really that developed. You haven't like acquired a white sample of them. You haven't, you don't know like what goes into the food. You don't know exactly, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, well, you can't really appreciate it in its fullest then. And I'm a connoisseur. I had a membership to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts that I never used. Well, exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like you have a bit more of a palette for painting. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Your taste buds. I just never developed taste buds for it. I just don't want to. Okay. Well, you're wrong, and the episode is now over. Yeah, so that's it. That's why it's you know it's just what it is. What it is for me. I know this is my worst take, and feel free to burn me alive for it. It's just never gotten to painting, and I didn't. Never, if at a high so level, to being that bad. At a high level, to me, it also like painting art feels like the most academically elite one. Like, have you seen see the? That. Like the the artistry groups and the way that people like the art industry will not allow people to buy paintings that are not of influence. No, I think it's a particular result of our modern and contemporary our contemporary world, though. Like mm. I feel like that's something that's very postmodern to come back to that term. Um, no, and, back to Michael and yeah, yeah, blame him for the state of of painting but yeah that that kind of like that kind of painting style and very postmodern and contemporary art i feel that yeah it's just nonsense i've i really don't see an affinity for most of it right um and it's not that i haven't tried just like a lot of postmodern paintings I, like you say it feels elitist and it feels like they're laughing at you but not in a fun and interesting way just like haha you actually paid for just a splotch of paint on a canvas that has no meaning to it. Fuck you. I'm like, great. This this is really making me feel like a valued art uh, like artistic connoisseur. Fuck you. That was my rant against postmodern paintings. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So the group of seven themselves, huge in Canadian art for both good and bad, as we'll get into. Um, so roughly they were active in the in, in the interwar periods, right? From 1920 to 1933, 34. Some people cut it off at different times. And they were basically a group of landscape painters that established themselves in Toronto. Um, although technically the movement and the people who constituted it knew themselves before the First World War as a cohesive movement that had a specific goal and purpose, uh, which we'll get into, they really did form in 1920, which is when most historians or art historians will kind of qualify the beginning of the group of seven. Which we are not. We are not art historians. Sure, we're we are. barely literature historians. <laughs> For this episode, we're art historians. You can savagely critique any of the paintings that you want. You can put on your art historian cap just for this episode. And then <laughs> next episode will be something completely different. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, Monty Python. And now for something completely different. Thank you for catching that reference. So um, basically what brought these seven painters together uh, the, was a conviction that Canadian art needed to be revitalized, right? It was the modernist era right across the world as far as painting was concerned and so everyone in the art world or at least modernists were concerned with the idea of making it new right to pull from a non-modernist oscar wilde um you know, artists were very interested in like hey the world sucks now after world war one let's try to 
revitalize our spirits and the world around us and our art by making it new. And that's kind of what the Group of Seven was trying to do, but in Canada. And what that means is basically ignoring European standards by not ignoring Europeans in their own art. It was a weird time. <laughs> I don't know. How, I don't know how else to describe it, <laughs> um, because they're clearly using European influenced techniques in their painting, but they actively refused to draw European subjects. I mean, they were focused specifically on the Canadian North, um, or the relative North. Basically, North of Toronto was considered the Canadian North for the Group of Seven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They literally drove like 45 minutes outside of Toronto, and that was the north. <laughs> <laughs> Which is barely There's an so much north. <laughs> Guys, I could still see the city. It's so much nature. <laughs> Look at the clouds. Well, Those are smokestacks. <laughs> I remember, um, there was another famous poet. One of the Confederation poets did that. He liked to like write poetry about like living out in the nature and being in tuned with the, the 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 natural world around you and the trees and all of those mountains but all he was inspired by was like the little root literally in his backyard he's like he was not out in nature at all he was still very much in like the montreal suburbs <laughs> <laughs> oh god so anyway um that was the idea of making it new right it was like foregoing uh, Europeans, uh, European subjects, still using European styles, though, because they had to have some standards. But what was also new right, for them was uh, the rejection of realism, which was basically the standard in Canada for most of the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century. If you want an example of what realism is in painting, just look Haven't up. we talked about realism before? Yeah, but in literature, it's not the same thing in painting. Okay. Doesn't matter. We're not going to get into it. Uh, it's basically a realistic looking painting, kind of, right? That demonstrates... <laughs> sort of. Yeah. It feels real. It's not necessarily real, but it should feel real and evoke a sense of what reality is trying to be. That's what the kind of paintings... I reject your reality and offering. substitute my own. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Um but yeah, as you can, as I'm sure you noticed, Matt, from the group of seven paintings that were, that you looked up, they don't quite fit the bill for realism. No. Right. How would you describe the paintings that you did see? It's like, it's semi-realistic. I don't know. It's like, you can, you know exactly what they're painting, but it's also like, they almost were painting like little kids would almost. Yeah, like it's it's nature from a very innocent perspective. Oh, interesting! Like, what do you mean by innocent? As or naive, I guess would be the better term. Mm, right. And like, do you want to elaberate on that? What what gives it? Well, a just sense for, of like, naivety? there's a lot. It's very. There's not a lot of details. Like trees will just be almost like a smudge, without leaves mm -hmm. on them. Same with the riverbanks and the water itself. It's just very much can like lines, connected lines, and you can tell what the nature looks like. But it's also, you can tell you, like, you're almost not seeing the nature. It's a, it's a, yeah. these are paintings that work as holes better than the sun, sums of like the different parts. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Like, if you look at the and clouds, I, you're like, these don't look like clouds, but it works with the rest of it to create a larger picture. It creates the illusion of clouds, right? Yeah. Like, because all art is illusion, ultimately, right? It's not an That's actual true. thing, it's demonstrating it's a, the thing. It's a simulacra. Hell yeah. Signifier signifies, let's go, structuralism and all that jazz. But all that like, jazz. What seems to like be different, at least from the group of seven, is that they're stripping away the pretense, right? That mm -hmm. makes it so a lot of paintings, you don't think of them as illusion, right? Um, and they're saying like, no, it is. I think you're absolutely right in saying that it only works as a whole. Because if you look at the mountains just on them uh, by themselves, they're too smooth to look like mountains. No mountain mm -hmm. is that smooth. But it only makes sense as a mountain when you recognize that it's on another surface and contrasted to the blue sky. Right. So you're like, okay, that that makes sense. So it 
it defines landscape. Yeah, right? it only looks like a mountain because you recognize it in relation to the other things that sort of look like trees. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing that sort of looks like a bird. Yeah, which is just well, that's M. just it. Like if if you sort of accept the real, like true nature as art of its own, like the purest form of art in life. Mm -hmm. This looks like people making a purposefully pale imitation of nature. Yeah. And we'll we'll get into that. But there's a reason why Margaret Atwood, in her short story, Death by Landscape, which we'll link into the short story, refers to these as landscape and not nature. Because there's a mm -hmm. distinction between the two. I mean, people often conflate the two as, you know, oh, if you look at a landscape, it's natural. No. A landscape is constructed. Yeah. Right? Um, a landscape is a very specific perspective of an environment, not necessarily natural. Um, and I think that that these group of seven paintings are landscape right? at the purest form. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. That um, makes sense. I guess I like it. You can dig it. Have, have, are we like... It. I dig it. I do like, though that there are actual distinctions in their styles because there, mm -hmm. there are seven painters, obviously, in the group of seven. There was uh, MacDonald, Harris, uh, Frank Johnston, Franklin Carmichael, uh, A.Y. Jackson, and um, Fred Varley, and Arthur Lismer. Mm -hmm. All of these were a part of this group, officially. Right? There were other unofficial members, like Tom Thompson, who... Uh, died actually before its formation, but was very influential on the style and development of the movement. Um, and some people also place Emily Carr uh, as an unofficial mm. member because she was active around that time um, and had similar interests, even though she never formally was interested in the philo philosophy and underlying ideas that the group of seven were, which is kind of what pushes her to the side. And also probably because mm -hmm. she was a woman, but we, we won't get into that one. I mean, we don't have enough time to take on the sexism today. <laughs> We're too hungover and tired to talk about sexism. Um, but yeah, what I like about them is that you can clearly see how they're connected in their themes, but they are very distinctive in their styles, right? Enough that you can like notice the different artists. Right. I don't know if that makes sense. You're smiling as if I said something like. No, no that's good. Sorry. Something else popped up really quickly. I had to take a look at. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you had a chance to look at like the different artists that were part of the group of seven. Um, like each Again, I decided styles. to look at the whole over the different parts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Please elaborate. Well, in the same way that you kind of like the group of seven, each, any of these guys individually, I don't think would have gone as far as they did but the fact that you had these seven artists that were then staking a claim on their art in this way definitely i think helps build legitimacy more than if they're any individual yeah yeah that makes sense yeah um you thought you were gonna call me out with that one didn't you oh get wrecked bitch I, I trusted you to i trust your ability to bullshit your way out of situations that that's how i got my degree little <laughs> You get an honors degree in Canada. You just bullshit your way through it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think my personal favorite, if I had to choose like an individual artist, would be Jackson, A.Y. Jackson. Mm. I just like his use of colors more, right? Because in terms of style, it's very similar, but his use of colors and different mm. layers, right? He kind of backgrounds and foregrounds his elements a little bit more than the yeah, other Yeah, look, I'm looking at his artist. stuff now. Right, okay. And I just visually and aesthetically prefer that more than the flat surface that some of the other artists did mm. and used, right? which I can get. It's cool. Um, nothing against, you know, Claire Michael's paintings, which were much flatter, so to speak, but I just <laughs> aesthetically <laughs> prefer Jackson's style. <laughs> um, yeah. Emily Carr on her own, like even though she's an unofficial member, she almost deserves her own episode because she's like a fascinating figure. Have you ever heard of her? Nope. If I haven't heard of the group of seven, I definitely haven't heard of Emily Carr. Damn it. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Was 
the, the other thing that I want to mention, right, as far as like influences go, is the underlying philosophy um, of the group of seven, which I don't think a lot of people are, you know, fully conscious of anymore, because we've kind of lost touch with, you know, what informed or what underlied philosoph philosophically like a lot of their paintings we just now in the 21st century see their paintings as kind of coherent right as part of a somewhat logical mm. group um but you know what influenced them was first and foremost a sense of nationalism right like very nationalistic almost to the point of racism in the case of some of the members um mm -hmm. which not surprising because a lot of nationalism does end up being that. Um, so that was kind of like the first and foremost element um, of nationalism, which makes sense considering they wanted to make it new and make it particularly Canadian, right? Mm -hmm. Not surprising there. What I didn't know, and this I found out actually from a comment that I received um, like many years ago at this point, when I was still looking for topics to kind of list um, to talk about on this show is that apparently a few of the members adhered to a very new philosophy in this moment in the 20th century called theosophy. Do you have any idea what that is? Theosophy? No. Okay. So no, the, yeah, you might've heard it under a different name. Like, because you're you're familiar with modernism, right? Like what happened philosophically to a lot of people after World War One, right? Because we went from a very religious time in like the 19th century and early 20th century, and then World War Two happened with its industrialization. Like well, World War One happened with industrialization. But World War One, right. sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, do you know what happened philosophically? Like what people were doing, and yeah, I don't know. Do you know how that? Would play so, out. God was more. dead. Yeah. Okay. Great. But God what does that mean, and... like concretely? Well, it means that people had to search for meaning on them on their own now. Like it was a time for a lot of people of what you would, what we would today call self actualization of discovery of what do we derive our meaning and our purpose to be on our own, and that was a common thing that happened at that time. Exactly. Right. And what's even more um, interesting, right? is that while people were slowly coming to terms with the fact that like the world was a very modern and horrifying place, right? As you're saying, God was dead. People were still profoundly religious. Mm -hmm. right? They wanted to believe in a higher power of some kind, even oh, though- Oh, we still do. Yeah, exactly. Right. For some yeah. people, the higher power became science. Science was God. And there you have theosophy. <laughs> we got there, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Um, oh, we did. Is that it? Oh shit. Yeah, that's no, literally it. science is that. no, but that's kind of what theosophy is. I'm oversimplifying here, but what it was is, you know, in the face of modernity, trying to extend yourself beyond, you know, your material reality uh, through a combination of science, religion, and philosophy. Um, oh, it's and... Full Metal Alchemist. Yes. Yes, actually. Yeah, I'm hearing all this. I'm like, oh, this is just this is just the foundation of Full Metal Alchemist, yeah. which is an anime. That is, or or um, what's his face? Was it Charles Dickens who talked to ghosts? Um, yes. Uh, or uh, yeah, okay. Yes. He was a big nut into the supernatural. But that's he, he's a good example of this as well, right? Um, mm. Or you see this in the Sandman comic, if you're yeah, maybe don't movie. use an anime that nobody's going to know about. But I mean, Full Metal Alchemist is a really good example as well. It's like you know, um, the pursuit of using, truth as it is, yeah, exactly right, seeking a new truth, uh, you know, by extending beyond yourself through science. Mm. Obviously, that science is different now than what it was in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century when Theosophy was starting to emerge. Mm -hmm. um and what you saw like religiously a lot of theosophists actually were inspired by um what they called eastern philosophies or to use the terms oh, that they would yeah. have used at the time like oriental philosophy right so <laughs> buddhism <laughs> yeah. right, a lot of buddhism Orient. yeah exactly the the use of Began a very long tradition that still exists to this day of people going to 
Southeast a East Asia to find themselves as an excuse to take wild drugs. Oh yeah. I mean Thanks, what, Beatles. Not just the Beatles. Hell, you still see it in, in Marvel movies. What's Doctor Strange doing except going to Tibet to find himself? Right. And he finds enlightenment and power through like Eastern mysticism and shit. I want an essay about that now. I want doc I want an essay about Doctor Strange's theosophical work. The same way I'm gonna write my Zomcom essay. I'm still waiting. That that I I'm genuinely excited for that one though. <laughs> but where um where the group of seven is concerned, right? Because it this does relate to them. Because some listeners might be like, "Why are we talking about this for painting?" Um, this these ideas of transcendentalism and theosophy were very influential on art in general, right? Uh, you saw Emerson, for example, and the American transcendentalists were huge, right, uh, in this particular time. And I'm sure you're aware of them, Mac. Um, there's another transcendentalist that's very famous that i can't remember his name doesn't matter um but where painting is concerned is you know one of the main tenets of theosophy was the unity of all existence right which is a very buddhist concept um and even in some senses you see this in catholicism as well um but basically it's the assertion that everything in the universe right from the material that you manipulate on your day-to-day -day life to the spiritual, right, and the divine is interconnected and emanates from come some kind of single source or divine principle. Um, it's be basically everything is connected through God in the most abstract form right? uh, or some kind of divine principle, whether you call it God or not. Um, and that you can achieve knowledge of this unity through hidden spiritual truths like meditation and the study of ancient texts, right? Um, which is honestly the reason why I started, you know, studying literature. As you probably know, I just wanted to re reach nirvana through reading Canlit. Mm. <laughs> I will reach nirvana through the works of Michael Ondaatje and Margaret Atwood and Alice Munro. <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm getting close to it. Like once I finish my dissertation, then I'm going to just explode into a being of pure Canada. Pure maple syrup. Pure maple syrup and tar sand, baby. I was going to say snow, but tar sand is much better. <laughs> I'm just going to be this goop, this transcendental goop. <laughs> but coming back to... Um, Coming back to the uh, the group of seven, right? Based on this particular reading or their underlying influences in this kind of transcendentalism or theosophy, how do you think this kind of shines through in their paintings? Do you feel like that permeates in any way, shape, or form? Yes, I think so. Simply because so. of the fact that they well. Because the, the the thing about theosophy, we have to remember, it isn't just the pursuit of science, it's the blend of religion and science and philosophy to achieve a higher being and understanding. Yeah. And I think this comes from their painting because their paintings aren't so abstract as to be totally conceptual and spiritual, but they're not so specific as to be scientific and realism. Oh, that's really they cool. They exist in like I the like middle ground. Uh, there's a, they, they exist in a middle ground to me of you can understand what's being said and you can then derive a farther thing from it if you wish like there's there's this nice little middle ground they found i think between the spiritual conceptual and the specific and real oh i really like that that's not what i was thinking at all but that's that's really cool i have these occasional gems i was thinking of it through the through the idea of people Oh, okay. Because there are none. Yeah. And, oh, well, no, there were a couple that I found looking through the book that you put of them doing a person or something. Almost none. Yeah. Right. Like, it's not it's not what they're remembered for. I'll say it that no. way. Right. That's true. Yes. Yes. And they are not poor I feel people. like I, I feel like that's an important element is that you know people or barely or rarely exist. And when they do, they are rather 
camouflaged or not necessarily camouflaged, but they blend in nicely within the landscape, I feel, in a sense that does connect, right, them, you know, people to the land. And when they don't appear mm -hmm. at all, it's almost as if humans and landscape are just one. So I think on the level of the painting itself, the fact that there is little to no indication of people does demonstrate this kind of like unity of life theosophy thing that's going on here that you don't mm -hmm. need to distinguish man nature and all of that jazz it's just one thing all that jazz and, um the other thing actually relates to your point is the role of people as viewers and appreciators of the art because you know we're people looking at this you know we're engaging on a fundamental level with the art. And so we're adding our own meaning to this kind mm -hmm. of natural world that is not indicated by the lack of detail. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. No, it does. Okay. I think it does. Not the lack just... of people is an important part of that. And again, I think that speaks to the middle ground of it all. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of lead does kind of lead to some of the controversies that the group of seven faced um both in artists their own being time. controversial or wild i know um both in their own time and today i want to start with the controversies that to kind of yeah that that appeared in the more modern sense because it does relate to what i was just saying about people but we can then move on to some of the controversies in their own time because that doesn't but when so all of these landscapes right um were supposed to be in the wild right the untouched nature of canada outside of the city even though it was like 45 minutes outside of toronto sorry toronto but toronto. what's missing from these what's missing from these paintings if it's supposed to be a place untouched by civilization or untouched by white man what's missing <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i forgot well, so did they, apparently, because a kind of major criticism, or at least contemporary criticism of the Group of Seven is like, you kind of left out a huge part of, or a large, you know, gap, right? You kind of left a large gap in what you could have discussed as like indigenous peoples in Canada, right? Who were living Who are the indigenous the people? I only know of the perfect white Aryan Canadian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the disappearing Indian, if you really want to, like, that was a big thing at the time. Right? It's a magic act. Oof. No, but not just that. Genocide. It was a, kind of, like, it was, Oof, it was a genuine, it was a genuine belief that a lot of people had was that the indigenous person was just going to disappear naturally because of the progress of civilization. So you can kind of read these paintings as a perfect example of, like, this disappearing people because they're deliberately outside of like normative quote unquote normative white Canada and they're refusing to draw indigenous people or at least acknowledge that they exist in any mm. of their paintings um even though they could have and should have um yeah, should have would have yeah exactly no wouldn't have <laughs> um but yeah so that's kind of one of the contemporary um issues i don't know if you have anything to say about that in particular i like that reading of the disappearing indian as represented uh, in their or that trope as represented in their art i'm not the one who came up with this i remember us mm -hmm. talking about it in one of my classes i like that reading of it and you see it in emily carr as well i think more explicitly in emily carr but i don't know if you have anything to add on that in particular i think there is it's definitely a very valid critique. I also just think like the critique is valid in so far that it probably just did not cross their minds to yeah. include indigenous people. Which is, that's kind of the point. Yeah. <laughs> um like, it's it's not like, yeah, uh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, you, no, I think we were both gonna say the same thing where that is the point and that is part of the larger problem, where that it was like yeah, these guys weren't being malicious, but that's almost kind of worse in a way. Yeah, 
because the fact that they're they're trying to make this untouched pristine vision of canada is like what are you talking about right there is no such thing there were always humans there mm -hmm. right like it is idealism or an idealized version of canada that, that never existed at any point right there were always indigenous people there so even so how far back do you have to go to like get this perfect vision of canada and it's like it well mm -hmm. forever it just doesn't exist it exists only in your dreams of a you know nationalist um mm -hmm. you know, it's a nationalist sweat dream in this case which is kind of i think the main criticism here um anyway it's not that that's not to say that the paintings are bad right that's not a criticism no. of the paintings themselves no no no, no this no, is no. this is a perfect example of a post-structuralist argument of art or uh, analysis of art it's like what's not there and why is it not there right um what will never so be yeah. there exactly or what will never be there i think is a really good way of putting it um, Very nice. again i have some gems um but yeah even in their own time apparently the group of seven were very very controversial i wrote down one review which i thought was very funny um they compared the first exhibition of the group of seven to the work uh, they compared their works to the contents of a drunkard's stomach right mm. um which i think is very funny and shows you just how little art critics gave a fuck at the time <laughs> if they were literally going to compare it to vomit <laughs> yeah so i think that's a bit harsh um i don't think I, I i'm sure it's not for everyone but to compare it to vomit is just odd to me <laughs> <I guess. laughs> um but yeah, there'll there'll be some some conservative criticism of modern art at any point in time, and that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, but apparently, like even the most negative reviews would receive rather clever responses from the painters and their supporters. Like they were willing to have genuine debates and conversations about their art. So good on them. Um, good on them. It reminds me of that Monty Python thing you mentioned monty python at first um yeah where they because it was the 60s and one of their members was gay um they would often get hate mail because of that and they would always respond <laughs> in the most absurd ways to it so and the one that st stands out to me most is a uh a very christian family reaching out to monty python and saying that gray and chapman should be banned from the group and sterilized like taking the like staunchest position on it. Mm. And they just responded by saying, yes, the matter has been promptly taken care of. Graham Chapman has been taken out the back and stoned. Thank you for answering. <laughs> <laughs> just not giving a fuck. Graham Chapman thought he'd taken out back and is now stoned. <laughs> oh, God. Um, but yeah, one of the things that I've also heard as a criticism, and this is again a more contemporary one, is that despite all of you know the criticism that they got in their own time, the group of seven mm -hmm. very much has established themselves as canon, right? They mm -hmm. are the group of painters that most people will at least have some knowledge of or at least have heard the name of, right? They are the representation of Canadian painting to this day. Um to the point where a lot of painters and contemporary artists in Canada will often find it very difficult to kind of break from that perception of Canadian art being other than this very specific thing, which happened for, right. in the grand scheme of art history, like not even barely more than a decade, right? They were together for 14 years. Um, and yet in the popular imagination of art, it was you know, extremely influential as far as Canada was concerned. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to the point where even you'll have art pieces that directly reference them even while criticizing them. So you have uh, art pieces like the Group of 67, which is a photographic art installation, which I highly recommend that people look up. It's like a, it's an interesting breakdown of multiculturalism in Canada mm -hmm. um, through the name, of course. Um but yeah, I feel like that's a valid criticism, personally. It's like this can it's a basically comes down to a 
criticism of canonization of artists, mm -hmm. which we've talked about before. I don't know if you have anything to add on it, but I think it's a valid criticism. No, I think it's, I think you're right. I think it works. Um, yeah, basically, yeah, that's pretty much all I had to say about the group of seven themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Outside of just like, that's cool. They're, they're nice paintings. Neat. Good for you. Um, but yeah, so they held their last ex exhibition in 1931, although they would technically stay together for a little bit longer. And now they're just kind of history. Um, just, just history, as if they're not like the most important painting group in a long time. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time on is the Margaret Atwood short story, which is not technically about the group of seven, but which is heavily inspired by them. Mm -hmm. Right. And I wanted to get some of your thoughts on it because I know you've read the short story or at least part of it, or at least the part that matters. If you started reading it, it's yeah. the part that matters. Right. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on like that short story. First of all, what is it and why might we talk about it in relation to the group of seven? So the short story is essentially about a woman who now on her own, her kids have moved out, her husband has passed away. So she decides to move into an apartment in a city downsize her life, get rid of some of the expenses, et cetera, that sort of thing. And so one of the things she's happy about with this is that she is able to find a place with enough wall space to hang all her paintings. And all of the paintings she brings up are paintings from the groups of seven. And, and so the paintings, as she discusses them, I think this is probably, and I guess this is the part where you were referring to the most important part of the story, it's a discussion about the valuation of the paintings and how we look at them and what do we think about, what do we say about them to be like, oh, this painting is worth this. It's how we treat art. Because she almost talks about it before when she was living in her house, the paintings were more furniture. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, you have to put a painting over the mantelpiece and a painting goes here and here. Meanwhile, now in her new apartment where she is forced to hang all the paintings very close together, almost like a museum, the paintings become a collection. Yeah. So that is absolutely like one element of the story, right? How do we relate to art? Um, mm -hmm. Which I think is something that not enough people think about, right? Like how the location of art and how our particular moment, if appreciating art actually changes it. But yeah, that's mm -hmm. a thing. Um, but the importance is actually in the title of the short story as well, Death by Landscape. Because mm. basically after the part that you read, what you've what the story becomes is a murder mystery, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Right. Where it's Lois, Margaret Atwood tale, of course it does. Yeah, exactly. Where like she sets up these paintings, right? Which as we've talked about are like landscape paintings a lot. And what happens is she then flashes back to a moment in her childhood that these paintings remind her of. And this moment is a time when she befriended someone at a summer camp. And the summer camp is a very kitschy one. It's supposed to be a quote unquote Indian camp, right? But it's a very like artificial indigenous camp. It's all, it's full of like the stereotypes tacky and stuff. things that, yeah, exactly. Tackiness and pr pretty much camps. what you'd expect. Yeah. It's a summer camp, but, with the added tackiness of like 19. All summer camps are tacky. <laughs> exactly. Oh, no, I know. worked at a summer camp. It's the double tackiness in this mm. case. But what happens is that Lois and her friend uh, go on an expedition um, as young girls. And one of them, the Lois's friend, decides to walk ahead of her and falls. Uh, presumably off of a cliff. And what Lois determines is that it's the landscape that killed her. Um, and that kind of brings up some rather interesting questions, at least as far as the story is concerned, some rather interesting questions of like, what does a landscape do? Or what does a landscape perform as a thing? Right, mm -hmm. Because it's not innocent, right? Um, as we were talking about before, it's 
a, a landscape is not a random thing. It's it's very selected. It's very chosen. What do you remove and what do you choose not to focus on when you're referring to a landscape? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what she brings up in this story, which I thought is kind of cool of kind of the themes that we were talking about before, right? Humans yeah. being kind of swallowed up by land, right? Both indigenous uh, indigenous constructions, right? Indigenous people as part of the landscape uh, or people in general as part of the landscape. And yeah, I just thought that was kind of interesting to bring up. I don't know if you have anything to add on that and like the concept of death by landscape, why that might be interesting or mm -hmm. important. Um, but yeah, I thought because it's a, a Margaret Atwood story that directly talks about it, might as well at least address it. Uh, but I don't know if well, you have I anything to add on it. No, I think you're right. And I do I do like the distinction of landscape versus natural paintings or nature paintings, mm -hmm. especially because these guys are doing landscapes, but they're so different from other landscape paintings. A landscape painting exactly. traditionally is this very manicured, set up, detailed, like taken in a perfect shot type of way, almost manipulated not to be a landscape or not to be a real landscape, what we want a landscape to be. Meanwhile, these guys almost feel, feels like sometimes they just took sponges to do their brushing with. I think, I think you're pointing to something very particular. Is like it tricks you. Mm -hmm. right? You brought that up at the start. It's like Lois's friend, uh, whose name I keep referring to her Lois's friend, but I, uh, what's her actual name? Lucy. Yeah, sorry, Lucy. Uh, Lucy is tricked by the landscape because what presumably happens is that she doesn't see where the edge is. Right. Mm. So she's kind of tricked into continuing to walk into the landscape and then dies. And it's very similarly, the group of seven paintings kind of trick you into believing that it's nature, even though, again, that that there is no such thing that exists anywhere, especially not in Canada. Um, and so this trickery that's going on, like creates this this very interesting illusion to come back to 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 another uh, element that you were that we were discussing earlier but yeah i think that's i think that's cool mm -hmm. <laughs> good on you maggie atwood you did a good <laughs> thing with this story good job another good thing by maggie atwood um we're, we're not going to get into this i don't think today just because we were, we've already been talking for a bit but um there is something to say as well about atwood's specific interest in survival as a major theme of Canadian literature. And she would get this particular theme or this particular perspective on Canadian literature from her, uh, from her mentor. And who was, who was actually a professor of hers called uh, Northrop Fry, who had what he called like mm -hmm. a garrison mentality uh, or who called Canada and Canadian literature, something that had a garrison mentality just to say something that always saw nature as antagonistic and as holding, right. Um, something to be feared, right. Just beyond the, the bushes, there was something, there was a monster out there, whether it was an indigenous person or a moose or whatever, right. Mm -hmm. There was something out there trying to kill you. And yeah, she kind of incorporates that element. I think very interestingly in the death by landscape thing by, mm -hmm referring to the paintings and trying to imagine like what happens beyond the pines. Like you never see it because there is no background in the paintings. Well, it's like so, you said, all art is an illusion. Yeah. Foreshadowing. Generally in this case. <laughs> and it's, um, and I think that's an important, I think that's what makes the group of seven paintings resonate so well is that there's almost an acceptance of, an illusion of an illusion or oh, they're almost biting back at actual landscape paintings to say yours is even more fake and illusory than ours is yeah that's kind of cool what do you mean by that? like do you, do you want to elaborate on that like how, also, how that works it's landscape paintings despite that they are realistic and realism mm -hmm. as photos are are still very fake they're very like People take the time to set up their paintings in a certain way and frame things in a certain way. And it builds this illusion of what a landscape is or what nature is supposed to be. Yeah. Meanwhile, these guys just kind of said, fuck it. 
We're just going to paint what we're thinking, man. We're going to paint what we're thinking, bot, eh? We're going to paint the connection that we have to the broader universe. Yeah. Except we can't we're drop acid because it's the 1920s. <laughs> we're going to paint out our broader connection to nature. We're just going to paint, man. It's going to be ugly and it's going to be awesome. And it's true, though. Like In the acceptance that it's not going to be super pretty it makes it feel more sincere and real. Absolutely. It's something that can kill you. <laughs> like right. it's, it's ugly kill you. Yeah. There you go. I think that's Whereas you would never it. you would never get you would never get that impression from a like a proper realism landscape painting. You'd just be like, ah, pretty trees. Ah, yeah. the leaves are turning red. The leaves, the fall colors are coming in. Come little exactly. Tony. Come, we must get into the, the car to drive to the fall colors. That's what I think is kind of cool about the Atwood story is that it points to the disconcerting element of the paintings. They're pretty, but there's just something there's something off enough about it that you you feel almost uncomfortable. Right? And I think that that's kind of what a lot of art does at the end of the day mm -hmm. is that it unsettles you, right? Either unsettles in like the, in the yeah, like however you want to imagine the idea of unsettling. But yeah, it's supposed to cause that. And I think mm -hmm. the group of seven does that while being aesthetically pleasing. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what's interesting about it. For sure. All right. Well, I don't know. Do you have anything to add or anything I you want to mention? That's it. I don't right. know. I can't. Again, like I'm not a big art guy. Not a big art guy. It's fine. You know, just scroll left, man. Next one. <laughs> Swipe left. Swipe left. <laughs> if you're gonna join Tinder, you'll have to get the lingo. God. Please oh no. god. All right, Mac, take us away. All right, everybody. If you liked what you listened to just now, thanks for that. You can always reach out to us with any complaints, hate mail, or concerns on our Facebook page and by, or by email. We love getting hate reviews, it fuels us. You can support the show through PayPal, or you can demand to get your money back through a refund, even though this is free, so I don't know what you're doing. Please check out our affiliate links. They include readings by people who are much smarter than we are. You'll actually learn something listening and reading that stuff. Also, if you want, you can check us out on Patreon so you can laugh and us more, and you can pay for our humiliation. But, as always, this little turd pile will remain as free as always, totally independent. So if you so if you like what you heard, we'll see you next time on his. Sorry, I was about to say Historic Canadiana, but we're not that okay. anymore. We'll see you next Whatever. time on the Cultural History of Canada. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Without the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.